Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. They had not committed the same act or were not present and complicit in it. But he says, who is the figure of him that was to come? But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And I'm sure you understand the emphasis that Paul is making. He's comparing Adam to Jesus Christ. It's a very interesting contrast, compare and contrast. And not as it was by one that sinned, so was the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We know he deals with this in the next chapter. Do we sin that so there's more grace? God forbid. He says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I was uh, tremendously blessed by the, the special Sister Wendy saying, and really just, uh, I felt the presence of the Lord come behind it just immediately, and it was a tremendous strength and confirm confirmation to me, just gave me courage to, uh, to take the word of the Lord and just deliver it uh, with confidence today, because I mean, that could have very well been the title of what I, I would minister in today is down from his glory. And it's just wonderful. You'll see how we start here in the beginning. We're continuing on the subject of God created. And I, I apologize if it seems like I'm jumping right into the middle of something. But we were last time we walked through last service, we walked through the uh, first chapter of the book of the Bible, Genesis chapter one. And in doing so, we were showing things in the first three chapters and a comparison to the last three chapters of the book of Revelation. And, and, and so we've, we went verse by verse, and it was kind of laying a foundation for what was on my heart uh, for the next few services. And I was wanting to take chapter two and just go verse by verse. But I, I just feel so overwhelmed in this way just to kind of take it from, just kind of the, sow the seeds of it and take it from a 10,000 foot view and then go back and go specifically through chapters two and chapter three, verse by verse, for Lord willing. And it's become more and more uh, profound to me how that the first three chapters of Genesis are necessary to understand God and his purpose. And one of the key things that we were identifying last time is God is laying a pattern. And Brother Branham even identified how that God was foreshadowing things and he was sowing seeds and it was a prefigure and things. God was doing things even in the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest that the Bible says it was a pattern that was later followed in worship and, and taking the Sabbath day. And so there's, a, there's God was laying something down and a track, so to speak. And we looked at the trail uh, of, of redemption and how Brother Bram identified and began to talk about the, the beast at the beginning, the beast at the end, and the trail of the serpent. But yet there was this trail of Christ that we can see from the book Genesis to Revelation. And to understand God's relationship to man, we truly need an uh, understanding of the creation and the fall of it. And it's as I study this and just labor in looking at this, it becomes apparent that the, the brand of Christianity that exists, uh, that, that pervades in most churches and most people's understanding, is one that's so narrow to the true purpose of God that it, salvation has really lost its true meaning and, and God's relationship to man has been lost. 
I want to start with Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And in reading this scripture, use something that may be familiar to all. It might resonate in terms of what salvation is. And, and if you were to witness to somebody and they didn't know God, then you, you might actually say something to the effect of, well, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so you would, you would start with this scripture uh, for someone to recognize their need for repentance, their need for redemption, their need for a savior. And as it said, and I just quoted it just uh, so readily, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I just want to use that phrasing there. And ponder this because there's a, there's a deep truth that's contained in this. For all have sinned. So there's none that have not sinned. And in this sinning, they've come short of the glory of God. Now we know that sin uh, entered into Satan. And, and we looked at this in Isaiah chapter 14. So we could see that sin or iniquity began in Satan. But then it was brought into creation through Adam. And it says in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So this sin, where it says all have sinned, it's because of Adam. It says, death passed upon all men, by one man sin enters into the world, and by this man sin entering in, death passes upon all men. So we have all come into this world as sinners, all have sinned and come short. Of the glory of God. So we see all men are sinners. Through Adam we all become sinners. And therefore being sinners. We're under the judgment or penalty of death. And it says come short of the glory of God. Now this is not solely a reference to God's praise of man. Can we say all, uh, all men have sinned. For all have sinned. And come short of God's uh, compliment. Or God's praise. Or, or God's uh, satisfaction. And you could use that phrasing to... Uh, uh, to the, the phrase falling short of the glory of God to express that sentiment that God is displeased with the sin of man. But it's not a reference merely to God's pleasure in man, but rather it's a reference to God's image. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory or God likeness. And all, so man is now fallen short of what he was originally intended to be. For the scripture says in 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, as he, which is the man, is the image and glory of God. So Paul teaches us that the man is the image and glory of God. But yet when you see mankind today, you're not getting the full reflection and manifestation of the attributes of God. There could be some similitude and certain similarities. But then we know that God is not like man that he would lie. And there's a lot of things about man that we know are not in the image of God. So when Paul says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, they have fallen short of this image that they were to be in. They are no longer God-like. It's no longer the divine image that's being expressed. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, and we're reading a lot of the same scriptures, but I feel that we're coming from just a little bit different angle to where I'm not just repeating myself. It says, and God said, as we've looked at this in great detail for these, through these several services, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. And it says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So this dominion, as God describes it, notice what description he gives man very quickly. If we make him in our image and in our likeness, now I've got to empower him or I've got to give him something that is also godlike. So this dominion in government is essential to God's image. Had Adam been made, uh, had been made in the image of God and not granted this dominion, then that would say something about God's likeness or God's power. But he's made, in the Bible continues, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And again, that part we've gone, we looked at very closely. That is also an image of God, a reflection of what is in God. But this dominion, this government, this power to have dominion over the fish, over the fowl, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing upon the earth. This is part of the image of God and it's part of the divine nature as Adam is placed upon earth and he becomes a God upon the earth. So it says God. Now we're pondering this. God made man then in his own image. God created man in his own image. So this is the original description of the composition of man. 
how, how he's constituted, his makeup. You can say his character, his nature, his instincts, his impulse, his thinking. God made man, created man. In the beginning, God created man in his own image. This is the composition of man. And Brother Branham says in the message, Fundamental Foundation for Faith, man was made as a secondary God on earth. He was given the power to control all things, all elements of the earth, all elements of the earth. So he's given power to control, but it's not, it's not, well, you can control this cow and you can control that dog. All the elements, all the atoms, all the molecules, everything that would uh, come together to comprise these elements. He's given power over them. And he says that was Adam. Adam was given, and I want you to kind of grasp a hold of this phrase. Adam was given these great powers. So Adam is constituted a certain way he has a certain composition a makeup a character attributes this becomes part of who he is and this is in him because of his god likeness because of a divine quality and so he's given these great powers so god has granted it to him and then notice how brother Branham makes a connection here and this is where i might just be amplifying this statement uh, through the remainder of the service but then the power that he was given to make himself is where he fell. Dramatic pause. <laughs> the power he was given to make himself. The power he was given to recreate. The power that was granted him by God. So you could define it anyway. The power that was given to him, it's through that power is where he fell. Now, we know that it could not be according to divine operation or, uh, in other words, it couldn't have been perfectly in the character of God. Uh, we just know this by virtue of looking back in history, hindsight's twenty twenty. But we know he used that power and that's where he fell. Brother Bram saying the power that was given to him to make himself is where he fell. And I'm trying to be very deliberate in my language uh, as we go forward because there's such a tremendous uh, uh, truth that I want you to catch today. So the power that he was given to make himself is where he fell. In Genesis 1.28, says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, become many, and multiply. So be fruitful, just you're going to uh, put forth seed and multiply, become many, and replenish the earth and subdue it. So you could break this commandment up into two parts. Be fruitful and multiply applies to him. Uh, and, and his image and him and the woman, but then also they are to replenish the earth and subdue the earth. So there's a part of them that must be multiplied up to completion. But then there's uh, there's also this uh, portion that relates to the earth to subdue it and replenish the earth. And this is an all or nothing provision. Brother Branham said the power that he was given to make himself is where he fell. Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. We saw this in Genesis 1.22. This is the power to procreate. This is the power to make himself. And so this is to fulfill this, you have to do all the ands. So this is an all or nothing provision. It wasn't be fruitful or multiply or replenish the earth or subdue it. If it was or, you could just get one and say, we did it. Right? It's just like they say, wash your hands or wear a mask. Right? Then we would all just say, clean hands. But it's not a, it's not a, this wasn't an either or. This was all or nothing. It was an and. Be, be, multi, uh, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue the earth. And so this prophecy, whether it be multiply and re, um, be fruitful and multiply or replenish and subdue the earth. And specifically, I want you to ponder this. So replenish and subdue the earth. This is prophecy. Brother Branham called it an oncoming thing, a promise. So it was a promise. And since it was oncoming, it was prophecy. And it's this word, which is the original seed. This is the seed. This is something that's original God's spoken word. And when it says the scripture says, and God blessed them. The phrasing that's used and the word that's used, God bless them. It's not like bless your heart or God, you know, and just saying something over them. But God in blessing them is communicating to them the ability to reproduce. This is the blessing. The blessing wasn't, you know, I hope your days are uh, long and you have sandy shores and, and it's always 75 degrees with no humidity. And that would just be a wish, right? I just wish you well. I'm just blessing you. God bless you. Uh, safe travels. But rather, this is a communication of a divine a covenant. 
The blessing is a divine covenant for their continuance. It says, and he blessed them and he said unto them. So him speaking to them, it becomes a covenant then, a spoken word of God which grants them power. And so the word which we call a blessing, and it's, it's a phrase as a blessing, the blessing, the blessing. The word communicated to Adam by God speaking it. The spoken word empowered Adam or gave Adam a basis to place his faith and be able to reproduce. So it was spoken beforehand that Adam could take himself, make himself subject to that word. And so the blessing gave him the ability to increase, gave him the ability to satisfy and subdue the earth's purpose. Because God blessed him and in giving him the blessing, it's communicated by the original spoken word, Adam, the power to be fruitful, to multiply and then replenish the earth and subdue the earth. So this was power then to reproduce the image of God. If Adam is made in the image of God and after the likeness of God, then this power that's conveyed to him is to reproduce God likeness. And so Adam had the potential of divine power. And it laid within him. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. He's told that he's going to have, and we'll come to it maybe here in a moment. He's going to have dominion. He's going to subdue. He's going to have control. He, I've given you these things. This is God conferring upon him a blessing. God giving him power. And so this divine power laid within Adam. Power to impart life. Power to bring forth. Power to multiply. Power to replenish. Power to subdue. It's all laying in there. So this divine power, if I could put it this way, existed deep within Adam. It's deep inside of them. It's there. It's laying there. It's part of the image of God. But yet, it's not developed. The power lays within them, but it hasn't been manifested. It's hidden or concealed. And we can see that this great power that he was given to make himself could not be expressed unless there was a woman. So it laid within him as a potential and a possibility, as even an oncoming promise. But yet, it had yet to be manifested or developed. So it's hidden. It's concealed. If I could put it this way, it's as if the power is in the seed, but it lays dormant. Amen. And in the principle of a seed, you can take a seed and the life is in there and it can lay dormant for thousands of years. Amen. But once germatized, it will bring out whatever's in the seed. So the power is in the word. The power is in the seed. Adam is given possession of it and it lays dormant until the time, the right season. It's got to come forth in the right season. Now, so Adam conferred with this divine power to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. We know that he acts to bring forth and he has a, he has a son, Abel. And we see that he has other sons. So he acts according to what we would think would be in fruitful and multiplying. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold... The man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So I'm just going to stop there because I want to, I want to take out of this before the scripture continues. And I think we're going to pick up on it here in a moment uh, in, in, uh, in verses 23 and 24. Because it says, therefore the Lord God. So God acts because of this. But take what the preface is and what he says. The man is become of one of us, as one of us to know good and evil. So he says, lest he put forth his hand and in doing so, take also the tree of life and in taking of the tree of life, eat and live forever. Therefore, so by God's own words, if you could follow this. And if it, see, if I'm going slow and I'm uh, and if I'm going slow, it's a miracle in itself. But I'm wanting just to be very patient to emphasize this. By God's own words, the man is become as one of us. Man has further become something in the image of God. You catch that? Man was made in the image of God. After he made man, he said, this is very good. So man was in the image of God. But yet there was more to be developed. That we, this is very simple. Genesis chapter 2 is what unfolds this and reveals to us. Though created, God rest in the seventh day and everything's created. There's still more that needed to be manifested. More that needed to be expressed. And by God's own words, he's saying man has now done something to make him more like us. 
Because he says, man has become as one of us. He has done something to further develop this image. And he's now further in the image of God. So Adam's image was perfect in creation. You couldn't speak anything against him. He was granted powers, which was the blessing to make him godlike in earth. But Genesis chapter 3 shows us that through free moral agency, Adam exercises his God-given power. But in doing so, it brought death. By free moral agency, he's made a free moral agent through his own uh, free will. He acts according to this God-given power, but being misplaced, it doesn't produce what the seed was supposed to produce. So you're introduced very quickly in the Bible, the, uh, the, the, the sin of mixing something. If you take the original and change it, it can't reproduce itself. And so Genesis chapter 3 shows that, that Adam's act of free will was an unfolding of a power that God had given him, but it brought misery, it brought woe, it brought suffering, it brought death. Now, if, you've, if I've been able to make myself clear, and I have a lot of confidence in your ability to follow, so if, if it's not clear, I, I, I shoulder the blame. If we could be looking at a picture now, where Adam in Genesis chapter 1 and even chapter 2 comes forth, it's, the picture's developing. The picture's developing. Adam and the woman in the garden, every seed bringing forth of its kind, everything is placed perfectly. And now man acts in Genesis 3, and God's response is, man has become as one of us. Now, and then what, what transpires as a result of that is misery, woe, suffering, death, disease, you name it. Right? Now, I want you to consider this. Could have God been fully expressed if Adam only ever knew the Garden of Eden? And this is where it just, it, uh, this is where I want you just to ponder that. Could have God ever truly been made known if all Adam ever knew was the perfection of the Garden? Perfect love, perfect understanding of the love of God. Perfect fellowship. Everything perfectly in operation. So let's think about this phrase then. The man is become as one of us. Man had developed. We could say even evolved. To something that was closer to God. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. Notice what Satan says. He says for God doth know. This is in the temptation of the woman. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. We can say this is the devil's lie. It's his promise as well. The, the devil's promise is always a lie. If he promises you to wash your car, don't count on it. Right? Just don't, don't bank on it. It's not going to happen. So his promise is a lie. But yet, the devil's promise is confirmed by Genesis 3.22. Notice how he says it. If you, the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and you shall become as gods, as Elohims. And God says, the man has become one of us to know good and evil. He's, the, the promise of Satan has actually been confirmed. Now remember, his temptation of the woman wasn't merely about dietary restrictions. It wasn't about what they could eat, what they couldn't eat. Are you, are you gluten intolerant? Are you, are you a vegetarian? What are you able to eat here? Caffeine? What can you do? It wasn't anything about that. But it was about procreation. It was about the tree of life. It was about the power to create. And so when he's talking to him, he's trying to entice her. God knows that the day that you act is a day that you'll become wiser. Your eyes will be open and you'll become as Elohim. And as a result, you will know good and evil. This is the devil's promise, but yet it's a lie. Why? Because he hid, the, he hid death from him. And so the devil is actually referring to the growth of mankind. He says, if, you, if there's an act that you can take, undertake, there's something that you can do. And in doing so, there's going to be a further expression of yourself. There's going to be a further understanding and enlightenment. enlightenment. So he's preaching and he's sowing something, but it's sown in deception and it results in death. Or if I could say it this way, he hid, he lied about the consequence, which is death. Because man did, in fact, become as gods to know good from evil. But yet, the result and the consequence was death. So, he, so the, the Bible says, since man has become as one of us, now lest he take also of the tree of life. 
I, I, I think this is very simple, but it's if I don't if I don't do it correctly, I, I could be complicating this. Man is in a per, in creation. He's perfect, but he has potentials that are not yet realized. Prophecies that are not yet fulfilled when he acts according to a power that he was given. God realizes that man has now become, in my words, more like us. There's been a further unfolding into the image of God. Now, there's still more because he says, lest he take also the tree of life. It suggests there was more that could develop. So he wants to stop him before in this condition, he takes a hold of the tree of life and eats. And what happens has eternal life. Because if he took of the tree of life and ate, now all the, and everything that's represented that, the symbolism of it, it means that God now, man in his condition, he is going to be forbidden from something, can go no further. Because the further expression, the next expression, would have to be the tree of life or eternal life. Oh my goodness. This is just thrilling. Maybe you'll just watch me for the rest of the, rest of the afternoon. Whoa, there, I just told you how long I'm going to be. Or morning, Lord willing. So it's, it's showing that there was more that could unfold. I, and I hope my humor is not taken as irreverence. There's nothing more precious than, this, than, than you as God's purchase and the minister of the word to you. There, if he took hold of the tree of life, he's already become like us to know good and evil. Now let's stop him lest he act further and live forever. It, it, is that, do you understand that? Or do you, can you follow that? But since now... There is a vulnerability or a weakness because he exercised his power of his own will. God says this in verse 23. So it says, now, therefore, lest he take all, put forth his hand, take also the tree of life, eat and live forever. Because of this vulnerability that's crept in. Because when it happens, man's fearful for the first time. So now for the first time, he feels fear. And he, you wouldn't want to act out of fear. You can't be motivated out of fear. So God is laying some very significant principles in the very beginning that's, uh, that's uh, instructional to us and good for us to understand. But because of this vulnerability and this weakness that he has now exposed himself to by exercising his power, this power that God gave him in his own time, in his own will, God has to do this. And it says this in verse 23 and 24. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. To till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I want to identify just a, a few things very quickly here. God sent him forth from the garden. So he drove out the man. So it's God sending him. God driving him. God is, the, God is the force that takes man in the garden. Here he is in a perfect garden of Eden. And it's God that moves him out of the garden into the world. In, still in Eden, but yet not in the garden in its perfection. So something in the divine order had been upset. At least uh, to, the, to the optics, to the eye, to what we read. Something's been upset. But let me emphasize this. This is not the accident of sin. If we, if we look at, at God, the Garden of Eden as perfection, Satan marring that perfection, and then God's subsequent response to it being God moderating things and changing things and rearranging things and trying to make man suited for the fall and figure out redemption, we're missing the story completely. What begins to unfold is not the accident of sin, but it was actually God's purpose. And I know this is hard for me to understand completely, but I know the more I ponder it, the more I accept it, the more I say amen to it, the more I appreciate my salvation. Amen. The more I fall in love with Jesus Christ to understand the plan from the beginning. Yes. Down from his glory. So if you could focus with me very intently on this. God led Adam into the wilderness of Eden. God sent him forth. God drove out the man. And he leads him. He drives him out of this garden into, I want to use the phrase wilderness to contrast what the garden would have been. To till the ground. Now focus on that. It, it's, it's, God is being very deliberate 
I'm going to drive him out. And he uses the phrase, I'm going to drive him out. And now he's given a purpose to till the ground from whence he was taken. Till the ground. It speaks of the earth. So now he says, I was from whence he was taken. Now he's sent forth from the garden. And now he has this task of tilling the ground, which was the origin of his body. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, God says this. And we're, I'm looking at this to understand that this is, God's not, Genesis chapter 3 and 4 and the rest of the Bible is not God readjusting. And it took them 2,000 years or 4,000 years to finally figure out, oh, well, finally, I figured it out, we need to send a Savior. There's, it was all laid out from the beginning. So look at, it says, he sent out to till the ground from which he was taken. Notice what God says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not man to till the ground. So when God is kind of giving a description of the generations of the creation of heavens and earth, and he's, he's wanting you to understand the condition of things and how seeds were sown. And I, this is when I'll go back to this when we go through this verse by verse. What I want you to catch is that before the fall, God places man as a tiller of the ground. So this is part of his constitution. Especially in light of the blessing. In, in, in light of his powers, in light, in light of his commission, God is going, he says, he says, before the herb was in the field, before it grew, before anything was coming forth, before it was in the earth, or before it's manifesting. He says, before man had even come to till the ground. And it continues to describe these things. But God, before the fall, man is being described as one who's going to till the ground. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, 15, sorry. And the Lord God took the man... And put him in the Garden of Eden. So as it says in Genesis chapter 3. God drove the man out of the Garden of Eden. He sent him out to till the ground. But notice it says he took the man. Put him in the Garden of Eden. To dress. Which is the same word as till. And to keep it. So he's called. He says man is to till the ground. And when man is going to be brought forth. He places him in the Garden of Eden. And he has a purpose. His purpose is to dress the garden, which is to till it and to keep it. So he has a commission then. And this is something he must do. To keep, he must preserve, he must protect, he must perform. Keep, he must perform that which is spoken of the earth. He needs to till and to keep in order to achieve earth's purpose. There was one man that was given the responsibility in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. To see that the earth was satisfied. That the earth and whatever it was pregnant with, the earth and whatever potentials it had, and whatever it could do and whatever it could produce, man was given the commandment. You are to till the ground and you are to, uh, you are to dress it, till it, and you are to keep it, to cultivate it, bring out the life in it, preserve it, per protect it, and perform it. That's his responsibility. I want you to look at it this way. I trust you can see it from this perspective. That God specifically equipped Adam or gifted Adam with abilities suited for his commission. Amen. Abilities that were suited for his calling. He was called to dress and to keep. So in Genesis chapter 2 verses 5 and 15. And, and we'll look at it also in Genesis chapter 1. He, he is to be a tiller. He's to be a dresser. He is to be a keeper. And this is the love of God expressed. This is the grace of God to take man and give him certain attributes and characteristics that he would possess and that would be his to use. This is the love of God being expressed. Because then God drives Adam out of the garden. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, we read it. God sent him forth from the garden. God drove out the man. And then he guards the way to the tree of life where he could eat and live forever. And then you don't need to eat anymore. Right? You don't need to continually eat for healing. You don't need to continually eat to preserve the body and keep it going. So he's cut off from that in order to live forever. And he's told he's going to be sent forth from the garden even to till the ground from which he was taken. So when God drove Adam out of the garden, it was not before he had fully adorned the earth and specifically had furnished Adam to dress it and to keep it. 
God had already placed everything that man would need in the earth and also in himself. Can you see the grace in this? We read Genesis chapter 3 and it seems so much judgment, so much condemnation. But God knowing what was coming in his grace was fashioning man to deal with the fall. I'm going to make you a tiller of the ground. Why couldn't Adam just tell the serpent to do it? But he was equipping him. He was making him able. He had already placed it in the earth and placed it within Adam himself. As it says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. This is the conclusion. Before God rests on the seventh day, it says creation is complete. We can say it's a perfect picture. We understand already that there can be more to be developed, but the seeds are sown. Amen. Everything's furnished. Everything's there. God will not have to speak later to amend. God won't have to readjust. Well, Satan, oh man, I had my six moves planned, but I wasn't anticipating that one. I need to readjust my, seventh, my, my sixth move. There, there was no choose your adventure here, though it might look like it to Satan. All the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them, for man. Before man was created, and even before he was made flesh, the earth was fully arranged. Creation was fully expressed. And Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30, it establishes the order and the purpose of mankind and also for creation. All of creation has meaning in light of Genesis 1, 28 to 30. All of mankind is established, placed, and arranged uh, uh, under Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30. It is the commission to man, and this is what he must keep. And now everything in its place, everything is given a purpose, and everything has a place, and there's a place for everything. It's the easiest way to stay clean, right? Everything in its place, and a place for everything. And, and there was a place for it. That's how you wouldn't have chaos. You wouldn't have disorder. We're like, what is this doing here? Everything had a place and everything was in its place. And Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 29, places things in relation to each other. As it says in verse 29, and God said, behold, to the man, male and female, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Take that, you vegetarians. <laughs> Means food. He says, I have given you in this commission, in this blessing, in this empowering, every herb, every tree which yields fruit is your food. It's part of God's divine blessing. So even before Adam was made flesh... I want you to catch the order of this before Adam is even in a body from the earth. And even before that body falls and is driven out of the garden, God created substance for life and then empowered man to partake of it in order to sustain his life. This is before he's even in a body that would need it and before he would even fall. God said, I've made fruit and I've made vegetation. I've made these things for you to eat of it. Every herb that brings forth, you can eat. Every tree that yields fruit, you can eat. It's for you, for meat, for your flesh. And so God, before Adam even existed in the body, before Genesis chapter 3, God created and commanded the substance for sustaining Adam's flesh. God was already sustained. God was already making provision. God was already looking out after Adam before he fell. And if God would do this for man who is imminently going to fall, would God not do the same for you today? Can you not rest in his provision? Can you not rest in his promise? So in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So the image of God is now placed in a fleshly body, which came from the dust, came from the earth. Brother Bram talks about how all our bodies laid in the earth. He's talking about our bodies are already in the earth. All the elements, everything's already in there. 
And so now the image of God, which Adam was made in, which God is a spirit, Adam's made in that likeness, made in that image. Genesis chapter 2 does not re-explain or rewrite what happens in chapter 1. It's a further development. Genesis chapter 1 is perfect. All creation is made. Everything's expressed. All the host, everything that's ever going to be is already there. But now seeds have to come forth. And Genesis chapter 2 is God's spoken word developing and it's, and it's expressing things and God is bringing things forth. So he hasn't created again in Genesis chapter 2. And then I want you to ponder this. Genesis chapter 3 is also a development. Maybe just in the, the, the loosest uh, use of the phrase. It's a development. You might think, well, that's not a development. That, that's, a, that's a fall backwards. But it's a development. But this is a necessary development. Him being placed, the man, he's formed man from the dust of the ground. This is a necessary development for man to fulfill the prophecy or the commandment of Genesis 1.28. As long as he's a spirit being, he cannot do all the ands. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue the earth. He could not fulfill Genesis 1.28 unless he was in a body. So now Adam is composed of an earthly body with a heavenly soul and a spirit which came direct from God. So now it's an earthly body. We know Adam was made in the image of God, which is heavenly. And then it says God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So this is a spirit which comes direct from God. And when man now is placed inside an earthly body, now that he's body, spirit, and soul, man becomes a little world himself. He actually becomes like creation. Heavens and earth. Because the soul and spirit came from God, which is the heavenly. The body came from the earth. So Adam is almost a little earth, in a little world, a little creation in himself. And Brother Bram says this. I'm going to read from three places. I had a dozen that I could have read from because Brother Bram makes a very direct connection. Anytime, most of the time that Brother Bram talks about Adam's body being formed, he makes specific references to certain things. And in these three statements... You'll see how Brother Branham's identifying what the evolution was for. And I will restore. In the beginning, when God made man in his image, the first man, Adam, was a man like God. He was a spirit man. He says, then later on, we find after he made man in his image, there was no man to till the soil. Brother Branham, when he's looking at this Genesis 2, 7, he points to this phrase, there was no man to till the soil. That it was necessary for God to put Adam in a body to till the soil. Man had to do that. Then he says this. This is the other part that he mentions so often when he refers to Genesis 2-7. So he put man in five senses to contact his earthly home. That's the purpose of the body. So God, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, gives Adam a body which is going to allow him to properly relate to and go through and interact with all of creation, his earthly home, the Garden of Eden. Without that, he would have had a peculiar relationship to creation in the same way that God was still a mystery to animal life. And that God still would have been a mystery and, and, and unable to partake in the grass and, and, and the fruit and, and all of creation. There was a way that Adam had to be expressed and he had to be equipped with certain senses in order to make his way in the perfect Eden. So Brother Branham points to he had to come into flesh in order to till the soil and he was given senses to contact his earthly home. That's the purpose of the body. He says in Jehovah Jireh, he says, when he formed man the first time, he made them in his own image and God is a spirit. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And then still there was no man to till the soil. Then God formed man out of the dust of the earth and put his dual spirit in him. And that was the first Adam. So it's just Adam further expressed. And God's power to transform. He quotes Genesis 1.27. And he says, and then he goes on, and many things happened upon the earth. Then we, so he says, man was made in his likeness and in his image. And he says, then many things happened upon the earth. Then we come to find out there's no man to till the soil. Then God created man out of the dust of the earth. He goes, that was a different man. Now, I don't find anywhere else where Brother Bram teaches that this is a, a separate entity from Adam. It's a, different, it's, it's a different expression of the same Adam. That was a different man. And he breathed the spirit of life into him and he became a living soul. 
Now what God has done is he's taken man and he, he's made him into something that puts him in relationship to creation as the highest in creation. And he says, and man became, so Brother Bram is saying he was given senses, the body, Genesis 2, 7, so he could have a body with five senses to contact his earthly home. That's what it's for. And then it's for him to also till the ground to fulfill his purpose. And so this process of making a body out of the dust of the earth, breathing a breath of life into his nostrils, man becomes a living soul. Brother says, and then he became a living soul. That, that word is living, ka'i and soul, nefesh, ka'i and nefesh, living soul, ka'i nefesh. It's a, that's what the Hebrew is. That's what a living soul is. What he has done now by making Adam a living soul. Now in our minds we think living soul. We think a soul of man which comes direct from God. And we think this has acquainted him further with the divine. And this has made him more godlike. But actually the opposite is true. What God has done is now he's given him an affinity to the creation that he's to help. He's actually connected him to the ones that the commission and the commandment applies to. Genesis 1, 28 to 30 applies to mankind, animal life, and all the, 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 all the, the vegetation and life. Anything that would grow, anything that would come up. And it's given this relationship. Man, you can eat of the fruit and you can eat of the herb. Animal life, you can eat of the vegetation and the grass. And everything was placed in its order and everything had an understanding of what their role was and what they were to do. And so when God makes man a living soul, he's given him an affinity to the living creatures Genesis chapter 1 verse 21 and God created wells and every living creature guess what that phrase is living soul could have very well said and man became a living creature because it's the very same uh, 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 nefesh. it's the same living creature so in the fifth day God brings forth living creatures then in the sixth day verse 24 and God said let the earth bring forth the living creature. This is all happening before Adam becomes a living creature. So when Adam is made a. Flesh and I've given you this. I've made you this way. And when I kick you out of my garden, I've given you what you need, Adam. You will make it. Amen. You may not be able to live that thousand years because what I said, the day you eat, that day you die. But Adam, you'll live a long time because of the gifts I've given you. Provision I've made for you. I wonder if God wanted to say, Adam, I'm sorry, but I'm painting a picture. You'll understand one day better. The day when he woke Eve up, he said, honey, he's here. That one I told you about. The one that was to come. Despite what Adam lost when he forfeited that title deed. God made Adam knowing that trouble would come. I think we should rethink God's judgment. He made him knowing that trouble would come. And in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21... He says, unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. I'd like to emphasize it more later, but chapter 2 ends where they're both in the garden. They're, they're naked and unashamed. But now their nakedness is exposed. And there's shame that comes with it. But God cares about nakedness. And it says that God, the Lord God, made coats of skin and clothed him. This is when death, full death, fully enters. Because an inner, innocent creature had to be slain for man's clothing. So when we read it, it just says, and the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. That means God had to take the hide of an animal. And in order for him to do it, he had to kill it. Or it had to be killed, rather. I want to say it that way. It had to be killed. So it says, the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. God did not literally stitch together clothing, but rather he provided for it. And I may, I may just have to stop here, cutting this, this sermon in half. I just, I, 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 
I want to labor on this point now. The Lord God made clothing out of animal skins to cover them. But God didn't himself, because God's not in a body. And though God could have supernaturally done anything he wanted, created skins, but that wouldn't have been complementary to his purpose. What God did is he provided everything that was necessary for that clothing to eventually cover them. Now, watch this in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 8. Because now this is another parallel, Genesis 3 and Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. She's dressed herself. But is she dressing herself with her own clothing? Is she dressing herself with what she thinks is good and what she had her own possessions? No, but she's taken something and made herself ready. And it says in verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the linen is the righteousness of his saints. Brother Brandon refers to the scripture, says his own word. And he says his righteousness. That's what she was granted to be dressed in. So the bride is granted, furnished the necessities, furnished what was necessary. She was appointed and commissioned just as God blessed them. Now the bride is granted. When she's granted, she is furnished with what is necessary. And she's also appointed and she's commissioned. She is given what she needs to dress herself. So she not only has the elements, but she has the understanding to take it. She has the mind of Christ to know what he wants done with the word. So he has not only furnished the word, but given her the revelation to take it and wear it properly. Oh, hallelujah. Think about what the scripture speaks of. That God had granted, God granted to her. He had given her a revelation of the word of how to prepare herself. How to make herself ready. So in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, what do you see? And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 19, 7 says... Made herself ready. That phrase is used prepared. Same word. Made herself ready is the same word that's used. It's just translated to his wife hath prepared. That's, that's what one translation could say. His wife hath prepared. And the understanding would be she prepared herself. Because you read the next verse. Because she was given righteousness, the word, to clothe herself. So since she was given the elements of it, she took it and by revelation knew how to wear it. So when John sees the city, he says, I see a bride, a city prepared, made ready, made herself ready, prepared as a bride adorned, which means made ready for her husband. Now, this is the same thing that happens in Genesis 3, 21. You may say that's a very, very bold statement to make. I, I, I believe you're catching just exactly what God did in Genesis 3, 21. Just as the wife in the end was given the material and the understanding and knowledge how to use the material... God foreshadows this in Genesis 3, 21. And the Lord God made coats of skin and clothed him. The same thing happens in Genesis 3, 21. God, how did it happen? How did it unfold? In the sixth day, God created the lamb. He had already, before, before man was even created, in the sixth day, this is the beautiful symmetry. Man is coming. I'm going to create an animal. In the sixth day, before Adam even has any, before he comes forth from God in the image of God, before Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God created the lamb that would dress him. The very one that would clothe him. God said, I must make preparation before he comes. And he takes this lamb. God creates the lamb. And then right there in Genesis 3, 21, grants them the knowledge and gives them the revelation that this Innocent must die and they must wear it. That's how God made them close. He creates the lamb in the sixth day before man has even come forth. But yet he's premeditated. He's foreseen. And it's a lamb that's going to what? Die. Think about that. Here came an innocent lamb. In a perfect Eden, when God made him, he would die. But he was going to use it to dress his son and his bride. It's further understood 
that it was a revelation because in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Why? Because his, re his revelation was connected to the revelation that was given in the garden. His revelation was connected with Genesis 3.21. He had a revelation that in the garden, what was used to cover man when he fell was a lamb that had been slain and they were driven out of this garden in these bleeding skins that were flapping on him. Flop, bump, 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 as Brother Bam described it. Abel caught the revelation that Adam had. Adam had a revelation given to him by God in your condition, in your nakedness. I provided a lamb. Here's the lamb. You're going to have to kill it and you're going to have to dress yourself in those skins. We see that Abel now has the same kind of revelation because he takes the firstlings of his flock and he sheds the blood and he offers it back to God to create that connection and that symmetry of the first thing to die before being sent out from the garden. And the very first proper sacrifice made to God. All foreshadowing what? The lamb that would come, that was slain when? Before the foundation of the world. I say, Brother Aaron, why are you so emotional? I didn't sleep. <laughs> but this is just precious to me. I, I, feel, I feel more connected to the Lord than ever. Every scripture means so much more to me to walk through it this way, to see these things that are taken, that just dovetail. So Abel, by revelation, offers the firstlings. And that's what Hebrews 11, 4 says. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, something that excelled than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. His revelation granted to him, gave him righteousness. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. But it was more excellent than Cain's offering. So what was Cain's offering? Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now, you, you see the vast difference between the two? Abel's offering is connected to God's mystery. Abel's offering is connected to life. His, his offering by revelation expresses that the innocent has to die to appease God's justice. So, and this is what man must be dressed in. This is what he must be covered in. So that's Abel's revelation. It's directly connected with the revelation given in the garden. Adam, God created the innocent lamb, gave Adam the understanding that it needed to be slain and stitched and dressed and placed over him. He had the understanding what to do with it. So Abel's revelation connects to that. But notice Cain's revelation is connected to the ground, which is cursed. So his knowledge, not revelation, we could call it revelation, but his knowledge, his inspiration is not connected with the mystery of what was hid in the garden or what was get granted before Adam was driven out. But rather, it's only tied to the earth, which God himself had cursed. So he offers from the fruit of the ground. But now notice the connection and the symmetry to the fallen knowledge in fear-based religion or fear-based dressing, fear-based response. When it's not faith or revelation, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Are you dizzy yet? Good thing we all use our phones and our tablets now or there'd be dust everywhere. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open. So now they're open and what? No good from evil. There's been a further step in the development, but something's not right about it. Because it says, and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So before God gave Adam and the woman the revelation, they tried to cover themselves by their own will. It's the very same thing that got them in trouble. The enticement of the flesh, the knowledge of man, the, the, the seed of the serpent now is sowing this in through discourse with the woman. It's caused them to fall. But now they're acting, they're motivated completely out of character. And they know they're naked and they know something needs to be done. But what do they grab? They grab fig leaves. From a fig tree, God never said the trees that bear figs have leaves for clothing. He never said that. But yet they go to a fig tree that would have had figs on it. And they take the leaves thereof and they make themselves clothing. So it's, they have now some understanding of how to clothe themselves and cover up their parts. But this is before the revelation is made known. What's happening? God is letting his story be told. Divine love is being expressed. 
Sometimes we get so focused on the judgment that we miss his plan. So focused on the curse of the woman, the curse of the serpent, the curse of the earth. And we get so focused on them being driven out and, and, and the, the horror of the sin and the wickedness of the woman. And we're so focused on those things that we completely miss the pattern that God is laying in the beginning. Brother Branham writes this, thus what God worked out here in the garden was his predestinated plan. And he's referring to Genesis chapter 3. What God worked out in Genesis 3, what happened in Genesis 3, God allowed it to be worked out. It was part of his predestinated plan. Genesis chapter 3 is a development, not an interruption. The development was an interruption, but it was part of the development. It was a necessary one. Because he says, and when Satan had brought about that which was necessary to the purpose of God. I have, I, I have more... To share than I've even covered now. But I'm just going to close with this. Had Adam remained in the Garden of Eden. The mystery of God would have forever been hidden. Think about it. If he had just stayed there. And every seed came forth. There would have been a part of God that would have been left unsatisfied. There would have been things about God. That he would have wanted to express, but couldn't. Had Adam remained in the perfection of Eden, who God is would have forever been lost. The full manifestation of God. All God is would have forever laid dormant in the image. The potential there, the power there, the desire there, but never expressed. And this is what I want to leave you with. I would at least like to get to my text. It says, nevertheless, death reigned. Romans 5, 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over all them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Adam, who is the figure of him that was to come. God only used Adam as a signpost. He only used him as a figure. Because God's purpose could not be revealed without redemption. His full character couldn't be expressed without redemption. The very essence of his name could not be expressed without redemption. If I could say it this way, his need... And his desire to be a redeemer is at the center of God's character. It wasn't, it wasn't so much that God's heart purpose was to have a bride of his choosing. But one that he could reveal himself totally to. One that would experience every single part of his being. One that would know him in the fullness of of his abilities, one that would know all of his characteristics, all of his attributes, not just merely know, you know, God is a really good artist and God knows how to paint a sunset and God knows how to make high mountains, but all the things that he was, whether it be a comforter or a deliverer or a healer or a savior, he wanted her to know him in all of his names, in all of his character and all his attributes. So his need to be a redeemer, his desire was insatiable. He had to be a redeemer. It was an absolute necessity. Man was placed upon the, in the garden and God knew, unless he falls, I will forever be longing. And I read Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. It says, and the, all the heavens and earth were created and all the host of them. It so struck me last week with such full force and revelation. God said, that's it. From this will come my desire. I'm done creating. I will get what I want from this one. I will not create another alternate reality. I will not ever create again. My desire will be satisfied in this. Amen. And it was an insatiable desire for redemption. So not only did he foreknow Adam's fall. But he arranged all things. According to the plan of redemption. 
And then he sealed it. And let me say this as the worship team comes. That's what they say at the Bible churches. If the team will come. Let me say this. Maybe we could sing that song down from his glory. I was going to express it through so many different scriptures. Let me say this, the mystery of redemption is that whenever God redeems, it's always greater. The work of redemption, the mystery of redemption I just, I, 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 want, I want to stop, but I just feel God, it has to be impressed in someone's heart. God's need to be a redeemer. Can we just spiritually relax then a little bit when we see the chaos? When we see things turned upside down and we see something that seems so far beyond hope. God sees it and says, I need that. Right. And the situations that we face in the end of Laodicea, my goodness, we could despair. But there's things that we will face as the bride, as we triumph and as we're being raised and being lifted. There's great acts of redemption in store. And let me, let me add my personal conviction. I am here in Phoenix, Arizona, in this, in this state to walk in his plans of redemption and to be a co-laborer for God's purpose to redeem anything that is lost, no matter how far lost it will be. And if we have things in our own life that are upset and things that we go through and losses and things, don't fret, don't despair. There must be loss in order for God to have meaning. There must be renting and torment. God envisioned in the very beginning, he not only... Envisioned and foreknew that man would fall. But he arranged everything knowing he would fall for the sake of redemption. And could we not believe that God had your redemption in mind. Your claims in redemption. Your promises under the open Lord. Could, could, did God not already provide it? If he was providing for Adam in the beginning. In Genesis 1. In Genesis 2. In Genesis 3. For his reality in Genesis 4 and on. Would God not then in the end provide you what is necessary to get to the condition of the end of Revelation? Would God not do it? And what would cause him to do it? His need, his desire for redemption. That's what would do it. I, I say that we should just reverence him, and praise him, and worship him. And exalt him. And say, God, I trust you. I trust you. Adam in that fear. Brother Brown describes it this way. Brother Brandon gets the story and he just kind of turns it around. And he has Adam and the woman being dressed in the bleeding bloody skins of an innocent lamb. And they're walking out of the garden and they're so tore up and so anguished and fear is coming over him. And the woman, they don't know what's going to happen. But Brother Brown, I'm rearranging it. You can see then that God, as he begins to curse the serpent and the woman and then the earth, he was actually trying, he was actually sharing something, which was the mystery of redemption. And he was telling Adam, Adam, I got this. I've made you for this. I've already planned it. I, may, I, I put you upon this basis. Adam, I didn't make you sin, but I put the capacity to do it in you. I didn't force the woman to sin, but I put her on the basis that she could fall. I arranged it this way. And so as he's forcing him out of the garden and this fear might have come over him, God said, as they're walking, about to take that last step into the wilderness, Brother Branham describes how something dropped down out of heaven and he spelled it a little funnel, L-O-V-E, called love. And he said, stop! 
as the tears were flowing and the fear was gripping them and they were so anxious about the future. He said, stop. Don't worry, Adam. I will redeem you. Don't worry. Redemption has already begun. Don't worry. I've already made a way. One day, one day you'll stand upon this earth. One day the sons will be manifested. One day Genesis 1, 28 to 30 will be expressed. Don't worry, Adam. The seed will come through a woman. And he'll crush the serpent. And Adam must have taken that. And lived on it all his days. But he lived by the revelation. There's a redeemer coming. A revelation that God made me for this. Yeah, this is my job. Yeah, I'm going to sweat. Yes, this is going to be hard. But he made me a tiller of the ground. It's not going to be easy. But he made me for this. It's not going to be easy. But God has arranged it. Honey, Eve, don't worry. He's made it a certain way. And we can work with his seeds. We can work with his laws. And we're going to be okay. How many years did he live? Around 900 years? Let's stand. If he would do that for him. He did it for you. Whether you see it or not, whether you recognize it or not, he did it for you. You may not even understand it, but he did it. I know there's a song he didn't have to do it, but he did. But I'm just going to say it this way. He had to. He had to. Or he would have forever been a mystery. Let's bow our heads. Is there anyone that would want to give their heart to the Lord today? Anybody feel the love of God beaming upon a lost soul? There's something inside of you that says, Lord, I want to accept the plan of redemption for me. If anybody would give their heart to the Lord, you could just lift your hand. Say, Lord, I surrender my heart to you. If you want to stand for somebody else, say, Lord, I'm staking redemption claims today. Redemption. Say, Lord, I stand for one today. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're humbled by your presence. Lord, I, I'm emotional today. And I know that that can be a little bit of a danger, dangerous area, Lord, because I'm certainly not wanting to merely provoke emotion in the people. Something so deep within me has been struck. To, I, 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 I'm enveloped by something, Lord. And every way I turn, I see it. And I even realize that even as of late, and even in preaching on these things, I myself found that I was trying to, uh, to juggle what became redemption. What turned into a redemption story. And what seemed to, to veer and change course. But Lord, this past week, it's just finally, this, this picture's almost fully developed in that it always was the plan of redemption. Therefore, Lord, I take great comfort in knowing that I was in you before there was time. And my expression is in time. And it's fallen and it was weak. But you have begun a good work in me. And the seal which you have placed upon my soul is good until the day of the fullness of redemption. And Father, I pray today for any young person, whether it be my own children or someone else's children. Someone streaming at home who has a recognition that they have sinned and come short of your glory. Lord, I pray that they would yield their hearts to you for your purpose. And that you could begin a work in them as they repent of their sins. Change directions, Lord. Seek water baptism because they know that in repenting, there is forgiveness of sins. And as sins have been omitted inwardly, 
We go to the water as an outward sign that sins have been omitted. Lord, that would be my, my plea to anyone that is lost. And Father, as we stand as your elect, as Adam was one who was a figure of him to come, Lord, we stand with the word of God today on our side. And we make claims on our loved ones, upon our seed. Lord, we make claims upon those that have gone wayward. We make claims upon marriages that seem to be beyond repair. We make claims upon health that seems beyond restoration. We make claims for salvation in cases that the, so the critic and the skeptic and the, 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 the ones that doubt, the, the very ones that we would, might even believe to be akin to us, Lord, they would look at those situations and say, it's too far gone. But Lord, we join our faith to this word that whatever exists in the world today is a disease, whatever exists in the world today is an infirmity, whatever exists today is a weakness in humanity, your word had already made provision for a remedy. And we accept it today, Lord. We commit ourselves to you now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, touch your people. Amen.